Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar, Fiber Talk webinar series. I'm Rizafi Alam here with you uh, from FTH Council Asia Pacific. Uh, I hope everyone is doing fine. Uh, so today our webinar topic is, uh, as you all know, that it's the topic is smooth operator transitioning from GPON slash EPON to XGS PON and uh, 10 G uh, EPON. So this webinar basically uh, will give you a grasp the basics of FTTX technologies and uh, how XPON functions and the main architecture around it. Our expert will tackle uh, some of the challenges experienced in the field and uh, provide insight into uh, how to ensure a smooth transition. So uh, regarding our speaker, we have been joined by Raymond Lai today uh, from X4. So Raymond has been with X4 for more than 14 years now, uh, holding different uh, regional roles with technical sales. Uh, application engineering, product support, training, product marketing, learning technology, and services consultancy. So he is currently APAC uh, Test and Measurement Technical Director. He plays instrumental role in driving the company product innovation uh, by bridging to the APAC market demand and evolution. Ro uh, Raymond holds a degree in telecommunications and uh, electronics. So before I hand over to Ro uh, Raymond, uh, uh, we have got some handouts there in the handout section. If you would like to check out, check them out, you can just go there and download them. Uh, and uh, after uh, Raymond's session, we will have one Q&A session. So you can keep your questions ready uh, or you can just type them in the questions box anytime during the presentation. And we, uh, at the uh, finishing uh, Q&A session, we will try to cover all the questions we get from the audience side. So now, uh, without much uh, ado, I'd like to hand over to Raymond now. Uh, Raymond, uh, please welcome. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good day. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. OK. Just quickly. Um, Rasafi, could you confirm audio and uh, visual is okay on your side? Perfect, fine. Everything's in order. Thank you. And uh, let's go. So uh, what I wanted uh, to share with every one of you here as the uh, title goes, uh, it will be quite uh, look like a, a forward uh, looking uh, kind of uh, technology. But in fact, uh, later uh, when I share the where about we are today, uh, you will find that uh, it is really happening right now. Uh, and today, um, since that uh, I come from a company that is uh, responsible for uh, test and measurement, I would like to bring a perspective of, uh, let's say, a current best practices, installation best practices, to how to help all our existing customer from operator perspective to do a smooth uh, transition towards a high-speed next-gen uh, GPON network. Now, uh, well, uh, while doing this, uh, I would like to uh, bring in uh, many practical use cases that uh, I'm sure towards the end, uh, you definitely can uh, appreciate uh, because these are many years of our hands-on experience in the field. Um, before we go to the you know, 10G PON network, in fact, uh, what we really need to bother today uh, is really on what we have. And to ensure that uh, the existing infrastructure fundamental is good, is giving and paving a successful way towards a smooth transition. Now on the topic, uh, we mentioned about GPON transition to 10 GPON. Uh, are you aware that uh, <clears throat> there are two variants in the market there? So uh, one is really uh, XGS PON, uh, even though there's many other uh, uh, names that you can call it uh, XG PON, for example, one. Uh, and then uh, you also we hear that coming up after 10G, uh, that will be a very strong push towards 25G, uh, followed by 50G. And this is something that uh, I would definitely like to uh, cover uh, in the first session related to the technology evolution and uh, to bring everyone at least to have a tour to understand what are the key components, uh, what are the evolutions and what is going to bring us to uh, subsequently. Now let's take a look uh, 
on one of the uh, market uh, forecasts about the variety of the pawn network that we have got today. You can see that, uh, well, uh, we are actually uh, seeing a, a big blue bar going in the uptrend that has a combo pawn, meaning that uh, the combo pawn has, is consisting of existing G pawn together with a new flavor of high speed pawn. And in that, uh, we had the red bar in the breakdown of XGS as well as uh, 10GE pawn as well. And on top of that, there's also another WDM flavor pawn, uh, which is currently multiple wavelengths uh, coming in uh, as another variety. And of course, uh, what you see on the pipe, there will be potentially 25 and 50 uh, as well. But uh, overall, uh, it shows a very healthy trend. As we all know, with this uh, pandemic, uh, the bandwidth is being driven and brought to the next level for all applications that we are involved in uh, virtually, uh, physically. Uh, it is never going to stop. The bandwidth demand is never going to stop. Now, we talk about the pawn. What are the key components on the pawn? Uh, I'd like to bring you a small animation to show you that how I can virtually construct a pawn network in front of you subsequently. So assuming that this is a network you can read here, a central office, uh, I can start the pawn network by building a OLT as an active component. Subsequently, uh, at the end of the customer site, I will have an element uh, called the ONT. Uh, there and the ONT would have two flavor. One is a G pawn, the other one is XGS pawn. Now, in the intermediate, what is really very, very important as a key enabler in the FTTH network, or we call it pawn network, is pawn. In fact, the word pawn stands for passive. So, what you will see, other than the active element that's shown on the 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 the, the end of the um, uh, central office as well as the customer premises. In between, almost everything are passive. And uh, fiber is a very key uh, element there. You can see that uh, most of the time, fiber uh, in the first section, normally we call it F1, mostly are underground, even though, uh, and the fiber on the F2, uh, they are mostly over the area of fiber, all right, uh, which is over the air. And uh, of course, uh, there can be uh, many other possibility in the network as well. But uh, one thing that we would like to uh, bring your attention to during today's discussion is to look at uh, what are the potential pitfalls that might happen, including splittle, fibers, performance, as well as uh, all, the, all those uh, network interconnect. For example, a terminal, uh, a drop terminal, and a terminal near to the user, and so on. That has so many connector and potentially uh, splices uh, along the way as well. And the the entire process to build the network, you can uh, you can imagine that let's say uh, it is a G pawn. You can uh, you can visualize that if I can take out, you can see that there are actually multiple wavelength running over a single fiber. Uh, that is uh, being uh, transported. And then, uh, of course, you may have also XGS pawn. Interestingly, we'll talk about the concept of cohabitant overlay of them. So uh, you can see that uh, X, uh, XGS pawn, for example, could be uh, overlay to the G pawn. And this adds complexity in the maintenance of the network. And uh, shortly, we're going to look at the uh, uh, different challenges and how to overcome that. But in short, uh, we, we see that uh, from the construction of the network in the F1, F2, eventually uh, the, there will be another team that is responsible to connect to the customer to perform what we call as service activation. All right. Now, this is a high-level view on PON, and you have to take a look at uh, how the PON is working right now. Uh, what are the standards that follow suits? All right. Uh, before we go into the standard, uh, let's talk about the market driver who uses pawn and who needs pawn? What is the driver to move it to the next level of higher speed on 10G, potentially 25 and even 50? Let's see. Well, you can see that uh, if uh, we wanted to say uh, the current FTTH uh, is already massively covering many residential and uh, due to most more people are working from home right now, a small business house operating from home, uh, we see a surge of the bandwidth uh, in general. And then uh, beside that, we also see that the businesses are contributing a big uh, growth, especially on the business like data center, 
everything is going social media right now. So the, the drive for the bandwidth is ever increasing. And uh, not to forget that uh, with the standard uh, that is backed by ITUT on G-PON or xgs -PON, another school is really on the E-PON and 10 ge EPON backed by IEEE. Both are delivering the same thing, but it's just on a different flavor or the protocol. And of course, another major driver, not to forget, is really uh, 5G. All right, you heard about small cell, pico cell, femto cell. Do you know that these are going to be a massive coverage a uh, very massive co coverage on this small cell in uh, near to uh, the residentials or near to the subscriber and all these are connected with very dense uh, fiber and mostly are very much shorter fiber and the interesting part of it uh, there's a study to say that uh, FTTH is one of the key uh, choices to deploy 5G because it is estimated up to 50% of capex saving can be preserved uh, if 5G is running over existing uh, network for either is a uh, G-PON or potentially xgs -PON. And on the standard itself between these two technology, I'd like to highlight that uh, the, what it actually brings on top of the higher throughput, everything else are getting more complex. For example, split ratio, it used to be 32 is the, the most of my customers are working on today. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, some stretch to 64. But in XGS Pond, it is possible to go up to 128. And also, of course, the wavelength as well. Well, we know that cohabitation is happening in the same fiber. Uh, so we already have 1310 and 1490. So one fiber are pretty busy with two wavelength. Now it becomes four. All right. So we have to take a look back into these uh, new uh, fibers, uh, lasers that are used uh, in the XGS Pond. For for this entire webinar, uh, we probably focus on G-PON to xgs -PON, but uh, if they are users of E-PON and 10G E-PON, the concept are very similar. All right, 10G speed, higher speed ratio, and then a similar wavelength introduced on them. Now, back to the uh, PON uh, element, right? So I promised that I wanted to, to let you have an in-depth uh, about uh, this PON technology overview in a very short time. Uh, and you can see that, uh, well, this is really the key element that I was uh, referring earlier on from central office, OLT, right, optical line terminal. And then from the user side, another active component that we see is really the ONT. Uh, well, there are two terminology that you probably hear, either ONT by ITUT, sometimes you hear the term ONU uh, in your uh, region as well. But uh, very important is that how it works is that OLT serves as kind of like a transmitter. OLT serves kind of like receiver. So one transmit, one receive through uh, the important uh, fibers in between. And uh, in between, there are many interconnect. And one of the key elements there uh, would be splitter. Uh, because later, why we're going to talk about fiber and splitter? Because it relates to the important concept of optical link loss budget. Uh, because if we had a, a healthy fiber network, uh, the uh, the message, the content that's going to send from the central office OLT to ONT will be flawlessly perfect without any complaint. Otherwise, you receive uh, many night call, uh, many trouble ticket, and so on, something that uh, we are trying to avoid. And uh, when talking about the splitter, particularly, uh, I'd like to uh, zoom in a little bit because this is one of the biggest uh, loss element. Uh, uh, if you do an analogy like a water pipe is connecting OLT to ONT, uh, you can visualize that there are big holes in the pipe that is causing the water to leak up. And a splitter in the, in the similar analogy is going to leak up a lot of power. And how much? Take a look. So on the concept of a splitter, uh, normally we see that uh, there are number of ports uh, within the splitter. Uh, we typically seen in the field deployment, uh, one by four followed by one by eight. So there'll be a combination of 32 uh, uh, in one cluster, 32 subscriber because four times eight. So uh, out of this, uh, out of this uh, losses association to the splitter loss, you might want to take note that for example, uh, a basic, uh, one split into two uh, splitter port is going to cause a 3 dB loss. 
And as we go up in the ratio, uh, you double the splitter uh, pot, you can see that uh, it, there is actually some kind of a linear relationship about three dB increase there. So let's say 32 is the ultimate um, uh, split ratio and also the, the cluster number of uh, uh, subscriber, you can see that we anticipate around 50 to 17 because there'll be additional one or two dB of uh, losses due to connectors, splices and fiber taking place in addition to splitter. So also uh, key takeaway, the splitter is key contribution to the optical loss uh, budget. In terms of topology, we've seen a uh, very common today uh, in, let's call it uh, the, the geographical area. We start with a metropolitan, highly dense population, and then we take a look on another newer uh, form of topology happening in rural area. On the busy, uh, busy city, uh, where high population are concerned, normally we see that this is a very even splitter topology. For example, 1 by 32 is very common. So this cluster of subscriber up to 32 will be sharing uh, one particular OLT uh, line cut or pods. And then uh, there will be, uh, besides centralizing uh, topology, there are cascading as well, uh, more than one are uh, involved there. So when it's more than one, uh, you can see that uh, it is even better uh, because geographically, uh, maybe you want to distribute out to, uh, to other uh, subscriber cluster uh, evenly, then uh, this, uh, this can be done. You can imagine it's done, this implemented in condo, uh, high, highly dense population, this uh, implemented on the landed kind of property. So going to rural area, a little bit, uh, new topology has been uh, has been introduced can you imagine that uh, you have an olt uh, when uh, to, to reach out to the rural area you can visualize that one road on the both side so every 500 meter or maybe a kilometer away there'll be one houses left the other houses on the right so they are very far uh, uh, distributed in a way in that case then uh, this unbalanced people are there in order to help uh, the uh, uh, the kind of uh, rural deployment with less density and the way how it works is really to incorporate uh, two stages of splitter uh, with a different ratio. Previously, you can see these are very much even light distributed, but right now uh, this is very uneven, 10, 90%. With that 10% drop to the user, all the blue are the cluster of the eight subscriber uh, and then all the green are the trunk of the splitter uh, that is going to carry and you can actually expand the, the splitter number from one up to 12 number of them. Uh, so you can see that uh, a different ratio would have a different uh, uh, losses as well. And uh, this even make it uh, more complex when it comes to maintenance uh, because uh, the rule of thumb previously we learned every 3 dB uh, would have uh, every every uh, jump of uh, one level of a splitter pot would have a 3 dB that would not apply easily here, right? There are too many uh, flavors possibly depending on the implementation. The complexity carries over when we wanted uh, to do the deployment and we want to ensure the quality are met. For example, this red color uh, referring to uh, the link loss budget that I wanted to make sure it is there because any of the losses are heavily violated, you might miss your, your link loss budget and eventually fail that deployment. And you don't want that to happen and the best way to do it probably uh, is to perform some kind of testing and Expo is able to help. We had an advanced technology called IOM later, I'll come back to that point. How advanced is the IOM uh, able to help on the unbalanced splitter uh, plus the, the even splitter deployment as well. Well, this is uh, what we see today and uh, putting it in contact of uh, transitioning to the next generation 10G pond, uh, you can see that uh, I mentioned the word cohabitant. Uh, you can also use the word overlay as well. How overlay is overlay. You can see that uh, traditionally G pond is using 1490 and then uh, overlay with uh, 1577 on the downstream. And then on the upstream, uh, you would have uh, the connectivity to anything. For example, you can be to a businesses, you can be to a residential, you can be to a small businesses inside, inside residential, even to a cell tower. So the possibility on the connectivity to the end users are limitless. And on top of that, 
uh, every of the ONT or ONU uh, that can be a XGS pawn ONT and that can be a G pawn ONT that running upstream wavelength very differently. If I zoom in into the fiber, take a look, take a dissect, it, they are very busy, busy traffic, okay? So the busy traffic consists of a G-Pon running on uh, our familiar uh, wavelength 1490 and also uh, um, th uh, 1310. And uh, also on the XGS-Pon, uh, we see 1577 uh, plus 1217 uh, happening there as well. So this one. And, uh, but one thing that later I'll come back to this point is that how does this uh, wavelength extension impact uh, the maintenance aspect for everybody. And then when we are at the 10G pond, uh, it's worth to just mention that the 25G pond are coming as well. Well, we're not saying much about 25G potentially go into 50G with a different, uh, uh, different uh, topology. Uh, let's take a look on what MSA group has to say when it comes to the 25GS pond uh, when coming to this uh, new evolution. Let's take a look there. There won't be any uh, voice over to you, uh, but I just wanted to highlight the point that 25 G, uh, GS pawn stand for 25 G symmetrical pawn. It means to supercharge your fiber network to ensure that uh, we not only uh, cater for enterprise is going high speed, but more importantly, 5G. Yes, I already given that uh, market uh, as uh, one key application there. So, and uh, the front of 5G today are going up to 25 gig uh, if you are in that space. And uh, so this uh, pawn is going to coincide with that, same as enterprise 25 gig E as well. So this is a perfect that we had to unify every single, uh, uh, co converging every single customer into a unified network. And this is really a very nice vision to have. But again, it didn't come without uh, much challenges, which we are going to explore in the second half of this webinar. Now, uh, there's a, I, I need uh, your help to get a little bit sense knowing what uh, G-Pawn, E-Pawn, and the different flavor of pawn there. Uh, maybe you won't have the full list as what I have there, but could you just uh, help me to answer? Uh, I'd like to know, uh, there'll be a poll that goes to you. If you can just pick in your region, uh, what kind of services you are using. Uh, if you are operator, that's best. Uh, let me know. Just uh, the polling is coming up. So I'd like to uh, get your view if possible. So it's popping up uh, in your screen. Okay, so uh, keep that uh, answer coming. I would like to see and like to share the data to you uh, after the poll is, co uh, is, is closing. But uh, for now, uh, I would like to uh, go to the next one. Okay, keep on going there. And uh, you can see that, uh, uh, well, we are trying to look at uh, a smooth transition, how we can help the operator, our customer to, to, to move there smoothly. But the fact is that there are so many moving parts, right? For example, it can be a network part, it can be a quality of the workmanship, it can be a, a technician expertise, uh, and there, there are so many things, all right? It can be a fiber, the type fiber you and so on. But we wanted to make sure that today our focus would actually cover the physical perspective, uh, making sure that uh, we help you to prepare for tension, right? So now, in order to go to the key uh, physical uh, parameter, uh, that would be, you know, a, a summary of what we should be bordering. Uh, it is none other than insertion loss that normally would contribute from a splice connector. And I'll say that the splitter should be one of them there as well. The other element are uh, macro bending. So we take a look what macro bending are and why it actually could be one potential uh, hinder to uh, a good uh, quality network. So it's a reflection as well. Uh, so we we'll talk about reflection more and more nowadays and uh, we won't uh, let connector cleanliness go away because majority of the network issue really come from this space. Now let's take a look on the insertion loss and the terminology we call it at attenuation. Fiber 
attenuated, right? So meaning that uh, the loss are being uh, reduced. And uh, this can, interestingly, can be, uh, can be quantified and we use a loss budget to quantify it. The splitter rate, uh, loss ratio table is one of the elements that you, you have learned. But uh, do you know that when it comes to the loss budget, do you know that uh, when it comes to light versus the power, I'd like to show you that every 3 dB of the losses here, they are actually uh, contributing to 50% of the power loss. So what's really remaining uh, that back to you will be 50%. Imagine that uh, typically in a GPON network, we will see a, a good 20 dB losses towards end user side. It is representing approximately 1% power remaining. This is so little that's uh, left. So to conserve the losses along the line from today is critical. So the interesting thing is that the best practices I'm going to share to you, they are applicable to today's network. When it will move to 10G or higher speed, uh, they are even more uh, prevailing. So when it comes to the co different component of the uh, losses that might potentially challenge the, uh, the loss budget, let's take a look what could, uh, what, what, what could be them you know, from the perspective of uh, optical fiber. Number one is intrinsic. Of course, the type of fiber uh, you use uh, because the fiber nature has got this uh, impurity inside that absorb the light that actually hits on the impurity. It can be also a uh, uh, backscattering reflections that is taking place whenever the laser source are hitting them. Uh, interestingly, uh, they are wavelength dependent. For example, uh, uh, on the wavelength of uh, 4090 versus uh, 1577, two different wavelengths. So they give a very different uh, performance when it comes to the losses. And also extrinsic uh, attenuation as well. Normally, it, uh, it is uh, induced and caused by excessive bending uh, on the fiber, especially during installation. And this macro bending could also be uh, another flavor of a micro bending, a built-in uh, permanent damage within that the fiber itself. So and uh, so it's a splice and a fiber and phase connection. The impact of, for example, macro bending, if the, ex the bending is too much, you can see that the light here, if you use a VFL to shine through, uh, you can see the red light. This is, uh, this is an indication that the, the bending has been uh, excessive. Shortly, we're going to dwell into how to uh, mit mitigate them. So connector loss as well is another key element. You can see, uh, well, the, the importance of the connector plus the splicing are the major uh, element of uh, loss there. But we will come back to take a look uh, how all these uh, four key elements are causing uh, the, the, the loss budget are being challenged. But uh, another, another consideration when we are doing the optical loss budget is that, for example, this is GPON, this is downstream uh, running at uh, uh, this wavelength. You can see that we had the relationship between the output, pow output power here. This is, uh, this is the output power. This is output power and uh, the sensitivity of the receiver. So if you tie this together, you, prox uh, you approximately will be able to tell what is uh, uh, the dynamic effective uh, optical loss range uh, that can be usable. And we call it the optical loss budget. So all the loss budget are counted like after you minus the splitter, the different losses, connectors, splices, and so on uh, that I was showing earlier on, then uh, what's left? Right. And you wanted to have a, a bigger safety margin uh, to ensure the, the network can run a long time without any problem. So another key uh, factors on, the, uh, on this uh, I was referring to early on is the reflection or pro probably um, many people also call them the ORL. Let's take a look on what this, uh, what this means. The impact. Uh, give you a speedometer here. Do you see that uh, if your ORL is uh, good, then you got a uh, good quality of system performance. Uh, so if your ORL is bad, uh, it, it gives you uh, what we call as a noise in the line. Uh, this is particularly, uh, you know, uh, very important if your network uh, are having some kind of amplifier and you find amplifier if your GPON network is uh, running RF uh, overlay. 
uh, RF analog video, for example, uh, that has the amplifier, they are particularly sensitive to uh, the reflectors on the network. When it comes to reflectors, we have two terminology we like to introduce to you. One is being uh, ORL, the second one is being the reflection. Uh, let's take a look uh, what the two are, basically. But generally, uh, ORL is about the span, the entire line uh, reflection. Uh, and this reflection is uh, referring to a particular connector. All right? Normally, uh, we want to have anything uh, negative 40 dB or better. And then uh, negative 50 are generally better than negative 40 in the perspective of reflection. Let's take a look a little bit more. So when it comes to the uh, reflection here, uh, you can see that uh, what, what, why, why it happened is really when light is reflected at each uh, end phase, you can see that uh, we had, uh, we had uh, this uh, reflection of light coming back here. Now there are two flavors in the market that we see uh, being uh, used and deployed. Uh, one is UPC type with flat uh, polish connector on the top versus the angle polish on the right. Of course, the parameter, you can see that this one being higher number earlier on we show you, it gives a better reflection uh, because uh, the light that goes there with the eight degree uh, deflected out, then uh, typically the number of percent you light return back to the transmitter are lesser, uh, it is better. The other uh, element is really the ORL. So this is also talking about reflected light, but it's cumulative of everything that comes back from each and every of the component that are in the way uh, of, the, uh, of the transmission line. And normally, uh, it, uh, the longer the fiber it is, you can see that the ORL are uh, decreasing. But come to a point, uh, 32 dB uh, should be really uh, the lowest value that are acceptable. And uh, when we are seeing anything lower than 32, uh, most likely uh, it will be related to the deconnector, something that we will dwell into uh, shortly as well. So now, uh, knowing that these are the challenges, so maybe you are curious, when I'm having this problem, what should I do? Uh, what should I be paying attention to? Is there a, a mitigation to that? Let's show you the remedy. So when come to this uh, point of the uh, um, uh, uh, reflection, we like to tie this to the connector cleanliness a lot uh, because 80% um, of the, let's say, the network would have connector issue and it is uh, perceived as one of the number one network uh, failure uh, and they, they are very much related to just a dirty or contaminated connector. And do you know, do you want to take a look how and how easily the contamination can uh, spread over? Let's see. So this is uh, before, right? So, and this is uh, after. So if you are uh, doing some testing, you thought that you're connecting your patch cord, which has been used many times, uh, did not take a proper maintenance care of it, you connect to, uh, to a new ODF. By, by the cabinet roadside terminal. And then this is the outcome after that contamination has been crossed over. Uh, sounded like a COVID, right? <laughs> uh, a scenario there. And right, the mitigation part is really uh, proper cleaning. If you just have to do the cleaning, then you'll be able to know. But how can you tell that without having to do that kind of uh, magnification uh, uh, 400 times and to see what's happening on the very tiny little uh, connector size. How can you know that? In fact, uh, some of the tools that OTDR that you've been using, they have the capability. For example, on the left side here, you see that uh, it shows a negative 31 of the uh, ORL, very bad. And then uh, the losses are acceptable, but kind of uh, on the high side. But once you perform a cleaning, you check that we test on the same point again, the reflection value improved tremendously. Uh, so is the losses as well. So it, one way it impact the losses, but sometimes it may not be significant that it passed, it sticks under your uh, quality audit and inspection. But the fact here is that the problem is there. If you are not taking care of it for G4 network, maybe uh, that will work. When, when you're migrating to a higher speed network, especially if you have a plan to put amplify uh, over, you know, the application related to amplifier into the GPON network one day, then uh, this might potentially backfire. 
And of course, uh, the best practices, uh, as I mentioned, uh, cleaning, we had this uh, slogan called ICIC. So first, uh, we use a tool called Fiber Inspection Probe to do the inspection. Then uh, knowing that it's dirty, then we clean. If it is uh, 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 clean already, don't ever uh, try to clean it, right? You may not know what is going to happen, especially you don't have a, a tool that helped you to have that visibility. Of course, uh, eventually, if you have this uh, fiber inspection uh, probe, uh, then you make your life uh, easy. This is one of the remedy you can use to overcome uh, the biggest problem uh, that you probably commonly seen uh, in, the, in the network due to the D and contaminated connector. And uh, in terms of uh, where you will see uh, these best practices can be uh, applied, in fact, it's everywhere. Everywhere, uh, so long that it, they are connectorized. Of course, I know there's a more splice on there, uh, it being implemented in the network. And the purpose of the splice on is to save the precious, uh, the, the lost budget. That is understandable. But the, the FIP will help you whenever you have you are connectorized. And sometimes uh, this is even happening when uh, fiber is going to the antenna, uh, where you have to climb the tower in the sky, you can deploy as well. Another mega trend that we are seeing more on the FTTH for your information, uh, it is on the 5G uh, predom predominantly, because as I said, small cell is denser and small to, uh, smaller, uh, shorter fiber. In order to uh, make that happen, you see that the, this type of connector called uh, MPO or parallel optics, in the same one block, you have up to 24 shelf number of fiber and so on. And uh, this is why uh, you know, we, we, we reckon the importance of uh, having these best practices. We introduce an innovation, uh, innovation that allows you to switch between single fiber and multi-fiber and introducing the concept of uh, RF, uh, uh, RF ID as well. So by touching the different tip between single fiber and multi-fiber, uh, the trash are automatically updated, so making sure that the users uh, don't bother about uh, the operational part of it because you know that whenever you measure, they are going to match against the right threshold you, and you won't get uh, long and wrong. And the threshold I'm referring to is the IEC standard, for example. So these are really the best practices that uh, is, is very interesting. Um, and uh, I want to put a very busy slide in the next tool for you. Uh, you can see that First, we had a G pawn on this one here, but uh, really uh, this is just a reference uh, and I wanted to point to you that OIL is always there. All right, the OIL guideline is always there and it's, uh, it's, it's not going to go away, especially we are moving to higher speed, more challenging environment, targeting on the next gen pawn, the OIL value will be there. All right, so now uh, the next thing is really uh, to, uh, to work on the splitter. Uh, uh, this this is another challenging part that we were mentioning earlier on. So this is how it looks like when you have OTDR running over a splitter setup, all right. And then uh, the the key to take note here is that when you wanted to have uh, so many issue related on the the splitter, this is how it's going to look like, all right. So you're going to test through it when the problem, uh, especially the high loss element, is coming from splitter. You have a great visibility of it, but it won't be easy uh, because the traditional OTDR has a lot limitation to overcome. For example, where you are tapping it on. For example, right now I'm tapping it on uh, the customer side. If I tap it on the OLP side, I put this, uh, the OTDR here in the hope that I can see up to 32 subscriber, uh, you may be giving a big challenge to yourself. Why? Because if you are shooting it from the OLT, there'll be so many reflection that you won't be able to differentiate easily unless you have proper inventory documentation, which port uh, is having uh, what particular length. OTDR gives you length versus uh, the location on the, 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 the location uh, with the, uh, the, the loss value or reflected value, then uh, this will be very challenging. So you have to do it right. So when you do it right also, you had a, a big challenge because uh, the OTDR require you to have a knowledge on how to do a proper setup. For example, this is one OTDR trace. And I can show you that I just done uh, in the background uh, two traces that uh, I have uh, been doing using OTDR. The first one, I use, uh, I use a, 
a pulse width of uh, 50 nanosecond and I can, sorry, 500 nanosecond. I can see uh, the far end uh, with uh, one micro band happening here, plus uh, the, the, the splitter here as well. But uh, anything that is before, I wasn't able to characterize. And then I show you another OTDR uh, trace that I was doing. Okay, When I decrease the pulse width to uh, 50 nanosecond, I can see much clearer, I can see the end, but anything happening before, I won't have any visibility. So it means that this story is uh, sharing is telling us that we had a uh, different pulse width, would have a different visibility, right? 500 uh, versus uh, the 50, it will give you a very uh, different uh, result altogether. And then you need to be, uh, let's say trained, and you need to be fully aware how this is done. So what we actually are doing, we introduce a concept called intelligent ORM. What intelligent ORM is uh, being used is that we had a multi-pulse. So the different pulses that we test uh, individually, now we collectively doing it and aggregate the result. And the result is going to let us have an outcome like this. Okay. So this is the outcome of the, the IORM uh, here. So we can see the near end event, all right? We can see after the splitter, the fine event. So the power of aggregating the different pulse width, which is the limit of the optic, and aggregate the result and present it into a different link mapper view is the very uh, big strength of us. And that's why we dare to say that uh, this year we are already 10 years anniversary with a very powerful algorithm on the IOM. Uh, we always make sure our, our users will have the right uh, first time uh, right experience, especially uh, when there's a red color indicating fail, you can uh, always come and uh, check out the diagnostic uh, accordingly, right? Uh, this is how powerful we are. So in case you are not so technical, you are wondering that, hey, uh, you mentioned about splitter, uh, so what to me, right? I'd like to share with you that uh, we have done uh, this many, many times, day in, day out, with many, many customers around the world. And uh, one of the use cases study that we have uh, uh, worked with a customer in Asia, uh, keep them uh, uh, anonymous. Uh, you can see that uh, they reported that uh, without a proper validation and uh, testing, uh, that they actually reported up to 16% of the failure contributing from uh, the, the splitter. You know, the, the big problem of this is if one splitter is happening, it's going to affect the whole cluster of subscriber connecting to that splitter. If it is from common port, if it is from the other uh, legs uh, splitter out, uh, it, it is still better. But you need to know where they're coming from. Then a traditional OTD, as I show you, you can see one side of the picture, not the other. You need to be well-trained, expertise, not easy. And this is why uh, we all come down to the whole point of how do we then uh, you know, use the right uh, tools in order to help us uh, to, to ensure a smooth uh, transition to a better network. So now, uh, do you want more tips? <laughs> do you enjoy so far what you're here? Uh, let me just go on. I have a lot of content to share though. So uh, one more uh, real life example is so important about macro band, right? Uh, just now I talk about the macro band uh, it is really as uh, uh, as we are doing excessive twists on the fiber, typically related to the install installer, uh, wasn't paying enough attention to fiber are sensitive to excessive bending. Then what happened when you have a tool like OTDR? You will be able to see that the uh, hey uh, same OTDR just having selecting two wavelength and run it, I got two different results. So this one a deeper a deeper a deep is referring to a longer wavelength had uh, more, they are more sensitive to bending in short, all right? And in terms of the bending, uh, you can see that uh, as I'm using higher the wavelength, the, the problem are become visible. If you are testing, you're having, a, uh, you're having a present practice that you only test with one wavelength because why? Save time, then uh, you might want to reconsider. And uh, later, I'm going to tie it to the evolution to the high speed network versus uh, macro bending. Very, very, very critical. And the bending uh, radius, you can see that uh, if you're using 652 fiber, it's about 30 millimeter. If you're using uh, 657 of different category, the smallest probably can go is 5 millimeter. So the type of fiber would determine uh, the macro bending allowance. 
and so is the higher the losses uh, is going to happen, especially if it's operating at higher wavelength. Now, let's take a look in real life network. What does it mean? Do you see that uh, I purposely uh, show you the animation that right now from g uh, 1490, we are moving to a higher wavelength zone. Uh -huh. So, and this bracket of consists of a different new technology uh, that you can potentially deploy in the near future. They are much more sensitive to macroband because we have done uh, the, the test multiple times that uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the fact. And in fact, it's going to cost you three times uh, more bending losses. Uh, so your margin will be challenged. So that's why I, I want to go back to the point that it is getting more complex when you're coming to the high speed deployment. So now uh, what's next? Uh, I'd like to have a quick poll question uh, looking at the, we have been starting uh, uh, like five minutes uh, late. I hope that I can buy more time to finish my content here. So I have uh, one more polling, uh, Rusafi, if you don't mind to help me out, just to make sure the polling is out there. Can't see so many streams at the same time. So assuming that uh, you are answering that, yeah, poll is opening, thank you. So now uh, I wanted to continue on when you are filling your polling because I'll take a look on the result shortly after. So the last part is really on the uh, a drop cable. Okay, uh, because most of the time I'll say home pass process is done, construction installation is done. It's more about serving a new uh, cluster of customer connecting and uh, you know uh, monetizing your FTTH network. And I like to pay more attention in the last mile because this is the activity that mostly related to what we call as uh, activation and maintenance and troubleshooting. All right, how do you keep happy customer? And uh, how do you keep happy customer? Well preparing your network to migrate to higher speed. I want to take uh, these two elements in one discussion. So typically, I wanted to say that uh, the tool that you have today, if they are running 1310, 1550, uh, leave it there. And uh, there's also a possibility to have an in-service uh, category. And you see that uh, when we talk about in-service is that the pawn network is running, but you wanted to perform some kind of test in-service by not interrupting the traffic, but able to find out the fiber fault location. And this is where the different wavelength, usually out of band wavelength, higher wavelength are chosen. And uh, 1625 was uh, uh, very commonly used in the past, but going forward, what we have seen 1650 will be one of the preferred manner. All right. And putting it in context on the network, right? So uh, this is where the, the drop cable are. I'm referring to this uh, particular zone here. And uh, you can see that uh, I wanted to talk about a new concept called uh, fiber multimeter in helping our customer to ensure they clean up, uh, reduce the trouble ticket and get first time right installation without having to go through the training of uh, OTDR that I was referring earlier on. So now the troubleshooting on the drop section, or I call last mount, is a blue section. Anything on the blue that up to the splitter is last mount. Secondly, is that uh, the concept of OX1 introduced here will allow us to get into a different perspective. For example, the first one is that uh, we have all the key metrics being covered, the length, uh, the losses, and the OL. Secondly, is that we even have the incoming power uh, for XGS network. Uh, uh, silo XGS network. And uh, this uh, unit is capable up to 10G uh, PON and uh, beyond as well. Secondly is that if you really don't want any training, you can push a button. There's this five star assessment like before you check in the hotel, uh, you before you book a hotel, you want to assess. So this is how we are helping based on the parametrics that you, meant, you can see here to uh, give an easy assessment way to help our many uh, newcomer into fiber testing world uh, and also uh, the experienced one to get their job done fast. Secondly is that when we test up to a splitter, we need to give some kind of a clear indication uh, to make sure that the demarcation is well served. And last but not least is if you have an overlay network, we can even detect g pawn and xgs pawn together with the splitter. If the splitter here is not detectable, you know that the problem belongs to this drop section last month. If the problem is uh, coming from right beyond that splitter, then usually you see this and you have the 
poor incoming power. So a lot of, uh, you know, multiple uh, measurement that is happening concurrently. That's why I call it a powerful uh, fiber multimeter all in one. And uh, giving you, uh, you know, uh, one recommendation to see the best way to drop a fiber to the home. Normally, you want to do this. Validate all, uh, all the way the fibers, you know, whether the connector is good or there's a hybrid connector, even the first connector as well. If there's any break already happening before you, uh, you, you leave the site, you know you don't have to call another team to come and fix it because the fiber multimeter has the capability to locate the fiber break. So are to locate microband, back splices, dirty connector uh, in the form of uh, ORL plus the insertion loss metrics. And uh, do you know uh, from our the survey of our customer, 80% uh, of uh, the OX1 user uh, that feedback, they actually save, uh, sorry, 80% of the time on site by having OS1, uh, which is very uh, much productive because traditionally people are using either VFL or power meter, uh, which would serve a purpose on its own. But let's say you have a poor power, meet, uh, poor power incoming, you won't be able to tell where the location. You have to call another team who has OTDR. It's a luxury to have the OTDR in your hand, but definitely uh, whatever you're doing is better than you don't do anything because you want to have a quality network to survive next generation pawn network, then uh, quality uh, is very important. And hence we introduce uh, optical fiber multimeter uh, for 5G, particularly shorter fiber, denser fiber. Uh, the technician are not fiber expert. Perfect, this is perfect for them, right? So now uh, I just want to close uh, this uh, sharing here with uh, one last use, case, use cases on how we can help uh, our users uh, to do the maintenance and fault finding there. So for example, uh, this is a, um, you know, a life of a day of a few texts in, uh, in, in there. So he can actually use the OX1 to test from home uh, to the splitter, you can see that. So to run a link map uh, is one of the tests that we have inside the OX1. And then, then we want to check what's the splitter detected because this is the demarcation. If it is detected, good news. If it is not, you know that uh, this, uh, this problem is coming from uh, within that his, uh, his own uh, section of uh, last mile. And the technician definitely have to find where the fault is before he leave the site. Secondly, after that, he actually can measure the power level between uh, the, the incoming power, be it uh, a single pawn network, or an overlay pawn network, right? as I shown you earlier on. Uh, once the power is determined between negative 11, negative 27, then uh, it, is, uh, it is good. And the, the other element that you can check with the OX1 is really to uh, do the ORL uh, checking as well. You wanted to make sure that it's 25 dB or higher value with less noise as well. Then uh, after that, you can come to uh, the house install, connect before you terminate and also connect to the OMT, you can do one last check to validate mechanical connection if this were the best practice you are doing today. So this is a one possible testing scenario using OX1 uh, to help our user uh, to be productive so you don't have to call someone else because if anything breakdowns, uh, you can diagnose and fix them on the spot before you leave. All right. And of course, uh, with that, I'd like to conclude uh, on today's session that, uh, well, I have mentioned about uh, point to multi-point most of the time, being a point architecture, but the same concept actually applied on the point to point uh, in uh, the measurement method that we propose here. And you can see here, uh, inspection is important. 80% uh, of network problem uh, can be addressed by FIP. Uh, fiber inspection probe and whether it's an uh, insertion loss uh, uh, due to splice connector uh, splitter and then the, the return loss as well all these key parameters can be associated to distance this information can be represented easily using otdr or a new category of tester called ofm and then uh, what's additionally OFM uh, can really offer uh, is that it is a one hand operation, ease of use and faster time to help the few tech who conventionally use a VFL parameter to restore, identify, fix and even diagnose a problem easily. So this is really uh, what it, it is uh, capable of. 
So now uh, with that, uh, X4 is a company uh, that serves uh, a full complete suite of uh, test and measurement, including uh, automation to move the data to the cloud, to help our user to be more productive or fiber monitoring 24 by seven. Uh, of course, uh, I'm sure that uh, my sharing will not stop here. If you have a, you show any other interest, particularly you wanted to have someone to talk to, to have a more in-depth discussion, workshop, uh, drop me an email. Uh, I have a, my team of people to reach out to you accordingly. And with that, I'd like to leave another five minutes of time for Q&A. So, Rusafi. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, that was really nice and uh, advanced level of presentation. Thanks to you. So, uh, the audience, uh, we will be having a uh, short Q&A. Uh, if you have any queries or questions, you can just type them in uh, the questions box and uh, we will discuss those. So, uh, I think we have started uh, receiving questions. So, uh, first question, uh, Raymond. Uh, this is from my side, definitely. So, can you summarize uh, the key takeaways uh, uh, when migrating to uh, 10G Pond? Right. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the great questions. Um, well, uh, you can always uh, refer back to this uh, playback, uh, which has a lot of insight there. But if there are only three things that uh, I would like to uh, summarize uh, as a key takeaway from for today's session, I'll say that uh, first of all, the pawn network are being uh, challenged uh, to the next level. There's always a higher demands on higher throughput. And uh, when we are ev evolving to the next generation network, uh, like 10G or potentially 25 as well, we can see that uh, the network are getting more complex with a lot of uh, higher splitter ratio. And there are many new applications that comes into it, enterprise, 5G, demand, low latency, and high throughput, for example. As it's getting more complex, as one number one key takeaway, we realize that uh, the, the tool set that we had need to be updated in order to cope with that. And then uh, the metrics needed to look into it. For example, uh, the, I, I mentioned about reflectance. I mentioned about uh, how to associate reflectance to connected cleanliness plus uh, the macro bending are some of the key uh, issue that are very practical and that they can help our customer uh, to transit smoother to the next generation network. The, the second element is about macro bending. As you see that the introduction of uh, the higher next generation that will introduce higher band uh, wavelength, like 1577, uh, away from uh, what we traditionally have 1490. So this uh, prone to be more sensitive to macro bending. So in the practices of installation, uh, proper care need to be considered, right? And uh, the last one and the third one, I will say that as uh, the whole thing is you know, moving into a very uh, complex environment, it is better uh, to ensure that uh, we validate from this point onward, validate our fiber network, be it we use it for GPON or preparing for tomorrow, because a healthy network will allow you to run the network for a long time to come, uh, irregardless of what expectation uh, that put on it. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's great. So uh, the next question uh, would be, uh, can you explain more differences between uh, your OX1 and the uh, power meter? Okay, I think this question is good uh, in a way. If I can just uh, go back to uh, a use cases that I was showing earlier on. So I'd like to come uh, here. So let, let's say in this case, our users go to the site uh, to install, you know, first he would uh, drop a fiber uh, to the home to the home and then uh, he would then use a power meter conventionally uh, just to detect the incoming power to be on the safe safe zone if it fails then the, the question started to arise what fails is it due to any of the issue there uh, any of the issue there one two three that i was listing on the left there or uh, does it really have to call another team because it is out of his visibility on how to fix things and uh, the time is precious, right? So uh, he has to make appointment uh, to this customer once again to bring another team with a different tool set. 
by having a handy type of uh, OS1, we differentiate from a, a traditional, uh, let's call it a, a dumb power meter that serves its purpose, but nothing more than that. So OS1 had, can help uh, the, the, the few techs to have more visibility, as you can see in these uh, particular use cases here, uh, more cleverly. And very important is fast, all right, fast. Uh, keywords is really fast. So without having to learn everything about the OTDR, uh, we can identify the location of any of the anomalies in the fiber network, act on it, uh, diagnose them, and then allow the field tech to, in one trip, fix it. So this is really a big value between uh, OX1 versus Palmeter. I hope that's clear to everyone. Thanks for that good question. Okay, uh, that's great. So I'll be uh, having one more question. Uh, the last question for today's session. Uh, the question is uh, uh, why traditional OTDR is not uh, easy to pick up faults uh, right after splitter? What is your view on that? Right. I, I think this is a good one uh, because uh, somehow I have uh, uh, mentioned that earlier on how uh, our uh, IOM can help. If I may just uh, go back to uh, what one of this uh, slide here to help me up on that. So you can see that the, the traditional OTDR has the optic limitation. Uh, there are different parameter setting associated to the OTDR. For example, pulse rate is being one of the biggest one. And then uh, when we are setting the pulse rate uh, at the specific, uh, you know, uh, uh, value of the pulse width, uh, then we only get the view of that. So if I categorize the pulse width, pulse width to be small pulse width, then I only get near end information. If I set the pulse width to be a larger pulse width, then I get a far end information. But I won't be able to get all of them in one go. And this is why in order to, uh, to, to, to get a clarity, and uh, luckily I was able to, uh, to do this uh, example earlier on, you can see that the, this is a one full example of uh, the characterization on the fiber tr through the FTTH by having uh, able to see uh, that this is a splitter. And then uh, the just uh, right after the splitter one by 32, uh, the near end uh, as close as 12 meter, and then right after splitter around, around 200 plus meter away, uh, the kind of fault that associate to connector and and uh, the macro bending and in short this is thanks to the possibility of having what we call as a smart algorithm multi pulse we take uh, the limitation from part and pieces of the oddr and combine them to make it uh, ever uh, mighty uh, let's call it avengers in action right and then this is how we can allow our user um, to be able to serve the you know to, to, to make it the right first time whenever uh, they go to uh, for fault finding maintenance or even if you have a project to ever wanted to improve your kpi let's say in from current whatever percentage you have to have a one two percentage point clean up on your network then this is really the best tool you can find in the market today uh, to to achieve that objective so to answer your question uh, otdi itself is good but uh, it won't be complete without some smart optimization on the algorithm and intelligent OLM serve that purpose. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Raymond. Uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, really grateful to you and Expo for uh, taking your time out for this session. Uh, so we appreciate all of that in audiences uh, uh, enjoyed today's webinar uh, so we will be keep our this uh, fiber talk webinar uh, series uh, keep uh, going and uh, you, you shall be uh, updated about the next uh, webinar uh, through email so please also stay tuned to our social media pages in linkedin facebook twitter and youtube and uh, this recorded version shall also be shared with uh, all the attendees uh, later on so with this i'd like to thank you all again uh, and uh, close to this session thanks a lot goodbye take care thank you everyone stay safe bye-bye